Yeah. Right. Right. Put that on his belt. You can put that, that on your belt. Mine's the most green. fun one I had here yeah, was when we got there. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. If you need me to ask them, I'm yeah, happy. They'll yeah, just come right in. Yeah. Sam, you're right here. Okay, folks, while we're getting organized, let me just say uh, thank you all for coming. We are delighted to have you with us. Um, my name is John Hammery. I'm the president here at CSIS, and we are fortunate to be partnered with our very good friends at the Schieffer School of Journalism down at Texan, Texas Christian University. We've been doing this series now. We do about one a month, and it's turned out to be one of the most uh, popular things that we do, and it's really because we're able to uh, to use uh, Bob Schieffer and his remarkable capacity to draw people that want to be with him and to talk about important issues. And we're, we're very fortunate that way. Uh, Bob is very generous with his time. And of course, we want to put together some of the most timely and interesting topics for all of you. And this is going to be a very interesting discussion tonight. We're probably, we're on the front end of a, uh, of a, of a big nuclear debate. We haven't had one in, you know, in Washington for probably 15 years. And we're going to have a rip-roaring one here in the next couple of years, I think. And we're, these are people that have probably done more to get this shaped and going than anybody. And I'll let, I'll let uh, Bob explain all that. I do want to give all of you a little advance notice that we're going to, on the 2nd of March, we have our next session, and it's going to be Bob Schieffer interviewing David Gregory and George Stephanopoulos. <laughs> now, won't that be interesting? The, the three openers, you know, on Sunday morning. I think that's going to be a fascinating session. Bob, welcome. Thank you so much for doing this. Let me turn it to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hamry, and thank you uh, again on behalf of uh, Texas Christian University and the uh, journalism school there. We have... Uh, Three people from uh, TCU here today. Uh, you can tell the TCU people because they're wearing the uh, purple ties. David Willock, who's the uh, chairman of the uh, College of Communications. Larry uh, Lauer over there, uh, who is the uh, vice chancellor of TCU. And John Tisdale, uh, who is professor uh, at the journalism school. So uh, this is a great thing for TCU, and we really appreciate it. The best thing about having a distinguished panel is you don't have to spend a lot of time uh, on introduction. So I'm going to be brief because all of you know who these people are. Uh, I would just say this about Sam Nunn. I've been a reporter in Washington uh, for over 50 years. In all that time, I always found Sam Nunn to be the single most effective legislator uh, that I came in contact with. I didn't think he was that old. <laughs> and that's the best part. <laughs> is the way he has been able to hold his age. Bob was here when I got here. <laughs> <laughs> I was. He's also a fine person, as is the person on, on this side of me, uh, George Schultz, who I must say is, meets every definition of a fine public servant. Uh, here is someone who held four cabinet-level positions, uh, uh, Director of the Office of Management and Budget, uh, Secretary of Labor, Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of State. In all of those positions, uh, he gave his country good judgment, good sense, and maintained a good sense of humor. Even when, and I was on this trip with him as Secretary of State, you'll remember this, Mr. Secretary, we went into Bonn, and when all the press got off the plane, the members, <laughs> the members of the U.S. Embassy press office gave us each a press kit that said, Official visit of Secretary of State Charles Schultz. <laughs> Don't I wish? <laughs> and I still have it, Mr. Secretary. <laughs> it's one of my favorite souvenirs. Uh, Sid Drill is a uh, senior fellow at Hoover Institution and advisor on nuclear matters to various administrations for 40 years. He is truly an authority uh, on nuclear matters, large and small. David Sanger said to me that Sid Drill probably is cleared for more classified information than any single person that he knows. And David knows a few. Which brings me to Mr. Sanger over here, who is the uh, chief Washington correspondent for the New York Times, a uh, English language newspaper. Uh, that is read here uh, in Washington. 
by the elites. <laughs> David did not go to TCU, uh, but he went to Harvard, which for many of us at TCU was our backup school, David. But we're <laughs> so proud that you could be with us today. <laughs> The, uh, the subject we're going to talk about today is the big one. Uh, it, it is a very big one, and it's going to be at the front of this administration's agenda. It's on the front of the world's agenda, and that is, what do we do about nuclear weapons? Uh, back in 2000, uh, Senator Nunn, along with uh, Secretary Schultz, Henry Kissinger, and William Perry, authored uh, an op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal in which they said we should begin taking steps to a nuclear-free world. And I just want to ask both of you, uh, we'll just start with you, Senator Nunes, um, since you are the chairman of CSIS. Uh, is that feasible? Is it possible? Is it just a fairy tale? Is it something to say, gosh, we wish we could do this, but this is never going to happen? How did four men who have dealt with this for so long come to the conclusion that, yes, it was something that we should at least be talking about. Bob, the four of us, George and Henry and Bill Perry and myself, we all went through the Cold War and we all supported deterrence and we all supported a strong national security, including a strong nuclear posture, because we felt that nuclear weapons then were a deterrent to every type of war, including conventional war. But we're in a different set of circumstances now, and the world hasn't adjusted. First of all, we've got terrorists who are willing to give up their own lives. There's nothing particularly new about that except the intensity of it, and us being the target is, uh, is new and unpleasant. Uh, but we've had terrorists for a long time. But what we haven't had is loose nuclear material uh, in large quantities, large enough quantities to make a bomb the size of Hiroshima. And what we haven't also had is the know-how, the technology, which we thought was a uh, monopoly of states for many, many years no longer a monopoly of states. People that get uh, a supply, a decent supply, a small amount, but enough to make a nuclear weapon of uh, highly enriched uranium can figure out if they get a couple of physicists working with them and people who know something about the technology, and that's not impossible. It's not a piece of cake. I don't want to make it sound real easy, but the know-how is spread all over the world now. And so the combination of nuclear materials spread around the world, know-how, and terrorists who would use it if they had an opportunity, is a fundamentally different equation. The other thing is fundamentally different, and I call it uh, the shaping of a perf perfect storm, is that the uh, nuclear industry is making a renaissance. Uh, now, I, I happen to support nuclear power uh, based on safety and security and reliability. It has to be part of the answer, not the whole answer, but part of the answer on the carbon problem. But the Non-Proliferation Treaty provides that every country that wants to gain uh, peaceful nuclear technology has the right to do so. The Iranians are claiming that is their right to make uh, to go into enrichment. The problem is if you can enrich for low enriched uranium to burn legitimately uh, in power plants, you can also enrich uh, the same technology and take it right up the scale to high enriched uranium. So those are all things that are happening now, and we are on the verge of a proliferation of enrichment. So the bottom line is we are in a fundamentally different position than we were in during the Cold War. We have other countries that now have nuclear weapons. We have a number of them who may seek nuclear weapons. And deterrence, as we visualized it during the Cold War, primarily between the Soviet Union and the United States, uh, is no longer the, the only equation. It's part of it, but it's not the only equation. So I came to the conclusion, uh, slowly but surely, uh, and George Schultz and Sid Drell and Bill Perry and Henry Kissinger came from different directions, but to the same general conclusion, that we had to change directions, and we had to get countries around the globe to work with us. Uh, we ha we're in a race between cooperation and catastrophe here. Without cooperation, we're never going to get the steps that we need to take to protect our own citizens. And without the vision of a world that at some point ultimately will not have nuclear weapons, we're not going to get the cooperation we need. So the steps are absolutely essential for our national security. The cooperation is absolutely essential for the steps. And the vision is absolutely essential for the, uh, the basic cooperation we need. That's why we came to a fundamentally different conclusion than we had during the Cold War. Are we headed to a world that it is more likely a nuclear weapon will be exploded than back during the Cold War? The way we're going now, with proliferation spreading, it's more and more likely. 
Sam has a great image, which I'll repeat, not as well as he does it, but he says, think of yourself on the side of a mountain. The top of the mountain is a world free of nuclear weapons. Air's nice and clear up there. We can't even see it from where we are. The bottom of the mountain is a world where more and more countries have nuclear weapons, which means more and more fissile material is around. And you have plenty of non-deterrent people, as Sam said. So at the bottom of the mountain is a world where it's almost certain that nuclear weapons are going to wind up going off in some cities. So we need to turn around and start going up the mountain. And we just have to do that. And we need to do it with determination to get to the mountaintop. And as at least as I see it, the way we've tried to formulate this, and the book that's passed out has important papers on the subject, is to say the vision of where we need to go causes you to think about how you're going to get there. And then you start identifying the things you can do. And when you look at them, well, they're difficult, but they're doable. It's not impossible. You can do them. And then that gives confidence, if these are steps that you can take, that you can get there. So there is an interaction here. It's also the case, I think, that every step identified when you take it makes the world safer. So we really have to get onto this thing. I've been struck in working on this at the difference in which the way our op-eds have been received with Reykjavik time. I sat there with Ronald Reagan and Hoppy House for a couple, two days with Mikhail Gorbachev and Edward Chabernadze, and we talked about eliminating nuclear weapons. I get back to Washington, and Margaret Thatcher comes right over. She summons me to the British ambassador's residence. You remember, she always carried a little handbag, a stiff handbag. Well, there's a verb in the British language, to be handbagged, you know. <laughs> and I got handbagged. I mean, I really got handbagged. He said, George, how could you sit there and allow the president to talk about getting rid of nuclear weapons? I said, Margaret, he's the president. He said, yes, but you're supposed to be the one with his feet on the ground. But Margaret, I agreed with him. Oh, boy. <laughs> but her reaction was very much the way people around town reacted. They were all devotees of deterrent, and they couldn't imagine and a world other than that. Ronald Reagan had a long conviction about this. He thought it was immoral. There's a book coming out, I don't know when, a couple of months or so. It's entitled Reagan's Secret War. And it's an amazing book because it traces through the long period of his convictions about this and the way he thought about it and worked at it and so on. It's really an extraordinary book. But at any rate, after this op-ed was released, I might say we put this together first. Sid Drell and I got it going at the Hoover Institution. We didn't have any money to have a conference, and finally we got a little money out of the director, and then we got a little more, and we got this conference off the ground. And after the op-ed was published, two foundations said, would you need any money? We'd like to give you some money for this. So we had enough money to do some more. But the reaction was entirely different. I don't mean that everybody reacted, yes, 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 but it was almost as though it was a wake-up call. Let me, uh, People have gone to sleep on this subject, and now and it's getting out of control, so we have to get going on it. Sid, I want to get to you in a minute, but I want to go back to Senator Nunn, because I remember uh, you also were a little taken aback uh, by what was going on at Reykjavik. Uh, uh, how did you come to have a different view of all this? Well, I didn't have a handbag. I might have <coughs> joined Margaret Thatcher at that stage. <laughs> But, but uh, what I always felt is that I, I, I said in, in, a, in a speech on the floor after being debriefed by George, and by the way, George, as usual, was the one who was always accurate about what actually had happened. There was a lot of confusion about what had happened at Reykjavik, and there were a lot of stories floating around. And I, I think George, without any doubt, was the one who had it uh, pegged. But once I figured out what had happened, I made a talk and talked about the fact that the nuclear weapons were our way of preventing conventional war because a conventional war 
uh, in my view, would have been heavily tilted toward the Soviet Union because they had a uh, preponderance of tanks and artillery tubes and manpower and so forth, the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union. And so I was concerned about getting the um, cart in front of the horse because I felt we ought to concentrate on the conventional side, which would lead to the nuclear. But I went back and reread that speech the other day, and it, it did raise those questions, no doubt about it, Bob. Uh, and at the end of that speech, I said, I do believe in the dream of uh, a world without nuclear weapons. I think that ought to be uh, a goal. I'm not trying to quote precisely, but we have to get the conventional balance right. And you notice one of the steps in here, because the other countries now, some other countries, including Russia, feel that they are in the position now that we were in then, uh, that they are at a disadvantage. So you have to work hard on regional balance, and you have to work hard on the insecurity that countries feel uh, about their own uh, defenses. You have to work hard in regions like India and Pakistan, where Pakistan feels that nuclear weapons prevent India from dominating with a conventional weapon. You have to work hard with Russia in dealing with them, not only a missile defense, but you have to put things like NATO expansion on the table. You have to discuss those things with them, not give them a veto, but discuss those things. You have to work hard on the Middle East situation where Israel is not uh, certainly going to give up their whatever they may have. They uh, don't make that clear, but they're not going to give things up without seeing some uh, balance of, uh, of, of, of peace in, the, in that region with a two-state solution and a lot more stability than they have now and a lot more assurance. So all of those things have to be done. It's not just nuclear. But the steps have to be worked one by one. We have to, as George said, we have to first stop going down the mountain and then try to find base camp and once we get to base camp together with others, then we head up the mountain. But it's going to take an awful lot of work. The whole equation has to be addressed, not simply the nuclear. Said Terrell, what is the first thing we ought to do? If you were going to draw up a list of things. Well, I, in my view, we have to uh, restart a strategic dialogue with the Russians. Because between us, we have more than 90% of the nuclear weapons in the world. And we've got to get a our act together and get an agreement on uh, what we're going to follow the START Treaty with, which is going to expire within a year. Uh, it, has, it has the only verification procedures that are in effect now. If that goes out of business, we have no means of verifying limits. So we, and when we have to settle some other uh, events like where and how we're going to work cooperatively, as we said, on, a, on an ABM system. So it, if, when we get to low levels, it might be effective against a rogue threat coming. So I think getting that dialogue started is very important. Then the most difficult immediate challenge is, is uh, the, the uh, spread of nuclear energy. Because according to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the, the peaceful benefits of nuclear energy uh, uh, is due to all signatories of the treaty. That means. They, they will, like Iran right now, be developing enrichment capacity. And it's a simple fact that if you can enrich uranium to the low percentage needed to run a light water reactor, you have more than what it, and, and to make enough uranium to power a reactor of reasonable scale, uh, you have enough, uh, you have a capacity to also make highly enriched uranium uh, enough to make a bomb. So that's, that's an immediate uh, problem that it's the commercial world as well as the uh, arms control world. You know, I said that uh, <clears throat> uh, David Sanger said you uh, knew, had clearance more classified information than anybody he knew of. As far as I know, David has no clearances uh, for classified information, but he seems to know a lot of he things. He proves you don't need and, clearances and to know something. I'm just going to give a little plug for David's book. This is a fascinating book, especially what he has to say about Iran and what's going on in Iran right now and what the United States is uh, trying to do about it. It's called The Inheritance, The World Obama Confronts and the Challenges to American Power. Uh, Bob, could I say one, yeah. one thing? Mm -hmm. Chet Crocker's here in the audience, and, and Chet wrote uh, with George, uh, George Inspiration a terrific paper on the diplomacy of, uh, of what has to occur. Uh, oh, in that's the direction great. we're talking about. It's, it's absolutely terrific. And it shows you the complexity of the parts that I was talking about yeah. and how different things have to be addressed. So any of you in the audience who are interested in the diplomatic side of this and the challenges mm -hmm. in that regard uh, would do well to read Chet's papers. Good. Maybe, maybe we'll uh, get him to ask a question here in a minute. Let me ask David. 
you did a lot of work, and a lot of it's in this book, about what's going on in Iran right now, and they're, what are they trying to do? Are they trying to build a nuclear weapon? Well, I, I guess I, where I came out at the end of the work on the book was they are certainly trying to get to the capability to build a weapon, and that may be all they need, uh, because as Sid just said, if you can show that you can do the enrichment, that's the hardest part of this entire operation. Uh, there was some intelligence which came out in a national intelligence estimate at the end of 2007 that suggested that they suspended their work on the design of the weapon. But almost everybody who I interviewed on that, even those who believed the intelligence in the NIE, and there was, there was some vigorous debate on that, said, look, once they have the enriched uranium, they can do the high enrichment in a matter of months, they can do the weapons design in a matter of months, and in the war nuclear age that we're in, a sort of second nuclear age, you don't need to have the arsenal to have the kind of power that comes with that. And so that gets to just what Senator Nunn uh, raised, which is as we spread um, nuclear power around, you could have a number of countries that have that capability without having a weapon. Now, some of them have it now, and we don't worry about it. Japan has had this capability for years on end. You don't see people complaining about that. Uh, but in Iran's case, and uh, certainly in the case of, of North Korea, which did drop out of the treaty, um, you've got a case where if they don't actually build the weapon, they certainly can export the technology. And you know, probably the scariest event we've seen in recent times was the construction of that reactor in Syria with North Korean help uh, that the Israelis uh, dismantled for them overnight uh, one night in September of 2007. Um, but that showed you that you could go on for years proliferating the technology and helping a country move along without detection. Um, I'd like to build yes, on what uh, David said about Japan's capability. But look at the diplomacy that people are taking on with respect to North Korea. You have to go to China. What do you go to China with? I should think you say to them, I'm not, I don't know what they're doing, but I should think you say to them, look, if North Korea has a nuclear weapon on the end of a ballistic missile, they've already flown ballistic missiles over Japan. What do you think Japan is going to do? They're just going to sit there? The, most, the worst nightmare of China must be a nuclear-armed Japan. So it shows, on the one hand, the dangers of breakout if these things start alarming people. And on the other hand, the kinds of things as a diplomatic process that you try to use to uh, persuade people to do something important about these matters. And that was exactly the argument yeah. that President Bush used with the Chinese uh, when he was trying to get them to lean on North Korea. The other trick they used was they, uh, they discussed North Korea's, with the Chinese, they discussed North Korea's extraordinary safety um, standards and then showed them a little map of if there's a meltdown at Yongbyon, where that plume of radioactive material goes and was right over Chinese territory. <laughs> that got the Chinese a lot more interested in me. Uh, let me just ask you about the diplomacy here, because it seems to me all of this fits in with what role NATO is going to play, NATO expansion. Uh, somebody here has talked about we, we have to have the cooperation of Russia. Uh, what do we want Russia to do? What do we, what is the most important thing we can do to have them see this our way or see it, the two of us see it in the same way? Seems to me from the standpoint of diplomacy, we don't want to get ourselves in a position where there's an American initiative and we go around trying to sign people up to it. That's not the right way to proceed. And Chet brings that out very nicely. We somehow want to have this emerge as a global initiative. And everybody has a stake in it. And we're willing to give leadership. and We're willing to go around and so on. But it should be something that people see uh, very much in their advantage. And that's beginning to happen. The, um, we had an it when we finished a second conference and we sat around, Sam and Sid and Henry and Bill and I and others, said, you know, we should have a conference in some other country and talk to people from other countries. And out of the blue came an invitation from the Norwegians. And they said, if you'll bring your act to Oslo, we'd like to have a conference. So we went. 
had 29 countries there, all the countries with nuclear weapons. And there, it was a, a great response, a wonderful conference. One of the interesting things was, this is weapons-oriented people that came. The nuclear fuel cycle was not much on the agenda, but it kept coming up and coming up and coming up. This is on the minds of anybody who thinks about nuclear weapons. So let's get going on diplomacy to get control of the nuclear fuel cycle. I would say that that's enormously important. The fuel cycle, working with Russia on that, is, is actually uh, got to be a, one of the top, top priorities. And they have made a very good proposal on that. The Russians have a facility at Angarsk, and they're basically saying, we're going to control the technology, but any country that wants to buy into it as an equity partner into this enrichment facility, and they would be able to get material, or they'd be able to make a profit if there's a profit, uh, they're able to do so. I mean, they made that proposal to the Iranians. The Iranians said no. Uh, as I read it, they didn't say hell no, and if we, if we basically get any solution with the Iranians, uh, then I think it's going to have to be along some line like that. The other feature of the in, uh, try, trying to stop the proliferation of enrichment facilities is to adopt the general premise that we aim in the long run to have everybody who enriches under international uh, inspection. Uh, that includes us. But we've got to be willing to do things if we want others to do things. We cannot uh, basically tell people to stop smoking while we're chain smoking ourselves. That's Director Al Baraday has said that over and over, and I think it's a good analogy. Uh, so enriching uh, material has got to be internationally controlled. And uh, I think the, to the extent we can prevent new countries from getting enrichment, I think it's a uh, great, uh, great help on that. Our organization, with Warren Buffett's support, has proposed a fuel bank. Uh, he put up $50 million and basically made it available to the IAEA. They would set all the rules internationally. That fuel bank, if matched two to one, will come into operation if the IAEA decides to do it. It would be a backup. Uh, supply facility so that if uh, the market forces were inadequate, countries would be assured they'd have a fuel supply. We've got to take away the excuse of countries to develop their own enrichment facility. Otherwise, it's going to be hard to control this, this nightmare. Another point with Russia is if we could have a breakthrough, and this is tough, it's hard, uh, it would slow it down, uh, but in my view we have time and should take time to view this strategically. We have an opportunity to work with Russia on ballistic missile defense. If we could begin working with Russia on ballistic missile defense, it would have an enormous effect psychologically because they would no longer view the deployments in Poland and Czech Republic as a threat to them. It would open up the door also to work on something else that I think is enormously important, and that is getting nuclear weapons off hair trigger alert. We still have thousands on prompt launch, just like we did in the Cold War. They still have thousands. It facilitates... Uh, all sorts of accidents, miscalculations. We've been very good during the Cold War, and they were good in terms of preventing accidents and miscalculations. But we were also very lucky, and they were very lucky. We had all sorts of incidents during the Cold War, and you take a, continued, a continuing a prompt launch policy by the United States and Russia, and you add to it India and Pakistan, you add to it uh, other countries in the world that have nuclear weapons, and uh, you add to it Iran and North Korea, and you've got yourself a, a real nightmare there. So working with Russia on ballistic missile defense is enormously important. The third thing is you can't surround Russia by taking everybody into NATO except Russia and expect them to react any way other than hostile. Uh, now, I've, I have favored uh, taking in new democracies into the European community and so forth. But when you look at Georgia on the map and you look at Ukraine on the map and you say, are we going to be able to work with Russia on nuclear weapons and work with them to help us on the Iranian problem and work with them on other problems if we basically take those countries into NATO right now against their protest? Russia has to, at some point, be a part of the Euro-Atlantic security arrangement, not necessarily NATO, but they've got to be included. We cannot expect them to cooperate if we continue down the line that the last two administrations have moved in, frankly. Yeah. There was another very important idea that came up at the Oslo meeting that George referred to when the, with the fuel cycle. There are a lot of skeptics who say that the goal of zero is unattainable. It's so difficult, not real. Of those 29 nations there, one point was foremost in their mind. If you want us to cooperate with you on controlling proliferation and making progress, you have to accept the point 
that we're not going to do that in a two-tier world. You have to accept the vision that all nations are headed toward this goal. And that's why it's so important that even though it seems like a very difficult challenge, we stay with this vision and work to, as Sam said, without the vision, we're not going to get the steps. And the countries made that explicit. You have to agree we're headed toward zero, no two-tier world. Want to ask a question? Yeah. In uh, the course of talking to the Bush administration about your proposal, um, the answer I got back was, first, they argued that President Bush had brought down the number of nuclear weapons through the Moscow Treaty somewhat significantly in 2002. Of course, there was very little done by the administration after that time. And the question I kept asking as I was doing interviews for the book was, why not? What had kept you from doing? And the answer I got back was that they couldn't imagine, even in a negotiation with the Russians, getting down to a level below 1,200 or 1,300 US weapons. Because to go lower than that, say to a Chinese 300 or 400, you would end up setting a target so low that other countries would feel an incentive to come out and match the United States. Not only would you make China an equivalent power, but the Iranians would say, well, we could get to, to three or 400. The Pakistanis, who are already at 100 or more, would be able to get to three or 400. So I was just wondering how you would answer the critique that came from the Bush administration, though they, I don't think at any point did they stand up and publicly criticize your proposal. Well, I can tell you what, what I would say. I would say, first of all, do you have any idea what one nuclear weapon will do, let alone 2,000? One of the kind that Sid can describe to you now, they're much more powerful than the ones in Japan. They would incinerate Washington, D.C. or New York City. These are weapons with awesome power. And if one of them went off in a major city somewhere, it would Basically, it would shut the world down. It would be so horrific. So when you talk about each side having 2,000 weapons aimed at each other, it's an inconceivable uh, amount. But then it seems to me that, that dramatizes the importance of having a goal of going to zero. This is where we want to go. We don't want to go down to 200 and stop or something. We want to go to zero. And this is the way you can do it, by taking these kinds of steps and by uh, being willing to work at it. Let me tell a little story, just for fun, mm -hmm. on this business of collaborating with the Russians on missile defense. At the end of the Reykjavik meeting, we'd also talked about getting rid of ballistic missiles as well as we were big time radicals there. <laughs> and meeting in, in this Soviet position had always been to try to get the Strategic Defense Initiative eliminated. So Gorbachev says to Reagan at the end, he said, Mr. President, if we get rid of ballistic missiles, why do you need a defense against them? And Reagan said, because people know how to make them, and there'll always be some rogue nation that may get them. And you and I will both be happy that we have an ability to defend ourselves. And whatever we get up, we'll share it with you. We'll work with you. And Gorbachev said, Mr. President, you won't even share milk technology with us. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the atmosphere of the Cold War days. That was true enough. But I think it's different now. And it's got to be different if we're going to get anywhere. We'll go to some questions in the audience as, uh, as we make a round. Just one comment on David's, uh, <clears throat> David's question. Uh, you've got to get uh, the other countries involved in the negotiations to begin with. The U.S. and Russia are going to have to move out first. No country like China or France or Great Britain or other countries are going to reduce their weapons when we are thousands and they are uh, you know, hundreds. But you have to anticipate that. They have to be brought into it. It has to be a joint venture, not just U.S. and Russia. And they have to agree, uh, at the very least, they're not going to increase while we're decreasing. So you've got to calibrate all of that into it. And at some point, uh, we, we of all countries, we have the strongest conventional forces in the world. So we, we basically 
uh, have, if you look at talk to our military, we have basically less need for targeting with nuclear weapons than a lot of other countries. So we have to take all of this into account as we're talking about it. But China, for instance, I haven't been briefed lately on it. The guy who's got all of the classified briefings could probably tell us, but it used to be that China did not really upload their missiles. They were not in a prompt launch uh, position. Now, if the United States and Russia continue the way we are, uh, then inevitably China's going to move in that position. And when China gets into a prompt launch position, uh, it's, it's not going to be very, very uh, uh, st stabilizing. Uh, so when people say, I can't visualize how you ever get to the top of the mountain, ask them this question. Can you visualize how we can have 10, 15 countries with nuclear weapons, terrorists running around, nuclear materials loose, know-how proliferating, and not have nuclear explosions? Uh, I can't because it's going to happen. And when it happens, the world's going to change. And it's not going to change for the better. So yes, it's a, it's a very tough job. But we, we've got to tackle it, and we've got to head in that direction. Sid, how likely is it that a terrorist could get his hand, his or her hands on a nuclear weapon, and where would be the most likely place they would get it? Well, first of all, there's still enough material, enriched uranium for uranium bombs or plutonium, not under tight control around the world to make hundreds, if not thousands, of bombs. The Harvard people keep track of this, and the Nunn-Lugar legislation, and then the Global Threat Reduction Initiative worldwide is being pushed ahead, but as many others have said, that ought to have a, a very high priority to get control on that material. Once a organization has uranium, and enriched uranium, they can make a bomb just like we did to drop on Hiroshima. That was a uranium gun-type bomb. None of this fancy implosion business. Simple gun-type bomb. Inefficient, but you see what it did to Hiroshima. We dropped it. It had never been tested. That's the most immediate danger. Uh, it would take a little bit more to get a plutonium bomb that you have to implode with, but the uranium one enrichment, that's the, that's the lurking the, the, the Nagasaki bomb was a plutonium bomb. And that had been tested. So that's a long time ago. But that had been tested in Alamogordo before we dropped it. That's available. Uranium's easier. What about bombs that are already made? Or, uh, how is the security uh, in, in Russia, for example? Well. Since, since I'm still recovering from uh, air launch cruise missiles flying from Minot Air Base down on Louisiana in this country, uh, I, I don't really know what to say. I mean, <laughs> I thought we had done better than that. It's, it's discipline and commitment. Uh, the military in Russia, we think, is in good control, but it's never good enough. You, you, the strategic nuclear weapons, the, the ones that could basically yeah. uh, fly across the yeah. oceans and hit us, are certainly better controlled than any others. The tactical nuclear weapons, the battlefield, short-range yeah. nuclear weapons, which the Russians still have, we worry a lot about those. Yeah. You remember one of the Russian generals who later died in a helicopter uh, basically said that a number of those were missing. And of course, the uh, Russians denied that. Uh, but the battlefield nuclear weapons are part of the missing agenda. Mm -hmm. We really, that needs to be up front mm -hmm. with Russia. We need to figure out how to get rid of all those battlefield weapons. They are terrorist dreams. You could put them in the back of an SUV they stole them. So those are uh, not as secured, in my view, as the strategic weapons. The third part is the uh, nuclear materials, and they are much less secured than others. And it's not just Russia. Yeah. It's uh, countries all over. Russia is much better shape we, uh, than they were 10 years ago on nuclear materials, much better shape. What about Pakistan? Well, I think that I'd put that right at the top of the list of, uh, of danger, not only because of uh, nuclear materials and nuclear know-how, but because of uh, possible instability in the country, and that's the ultimate danger. One of the points here is Sam starts putting things at the top of the list. Everything is at the top of the list. <laughs> that's right. There are <laughs> lots of things to do, and really the point is that if this gets going, and it, there seems to be a momentum building, if this gets going, it's a, it's a daunting diplomatic challenge. There is a huge amount of work to be done. So Secretary Clinton... I'm sure we'll be asking Congress for appropriations to expand, to be able to field a better and better team. And it's also quite obvious that people who are, quote, diplomats, unquote, are not going to be effective unless they're accompanied by scientists. You've got to have people who understand this from the inside out along with you 
if you're going to negotiate effectively. So that's another skill that's going to have to get going. We have but a I very think we have a big diplomatic task ahead. Yeah, you know, we have a very distinguished audience today. I'd like to uh, Congresswoman Jane Harmon is here right on the front row. Max Kappelman. Uh, would any of you like to ask a question? Chet Crocker is here. We've already mentioned him. And if not uh, one of you, then uh, we'd like to take some other questions from the audience if you have some at this point. And there's the mic right here. Jane? You wouldn't be a member of Congress if you didn't I wouldn't have be a, a member of Congress here. if I didn't speak. <laughs> right. No, I, I, I think this is absolutely fascinating. And, uh, uh, a, a huge reminder of the recent history that, that uh, many in Congress don't even know anything about. I just wanted to add to the stew uh, dirty bombs, which are much easier uh, to put together. I mean, the whole idea that you could take uh, some material out of a radiology machine at a hospital and blow it up in a window with two sticks of dynamite, and the half-life of some of that stuff could be 30 years, and you would contaminate uh, two, two square kilometers of Manhattan or something like that. I, I think that's extremely likely. Uh, obviously, it, it is not as horrific as the stories you're telling about what modern weapons can do, but uh, I, I just wanted to ask how easy that is and what strategies we could use against some of that, because I think if you ask the question, Bob, of what could really happen, what's likely to happen, or what's possible to happen, I think the dirty bomb scenario is much, much easier than any of the rest of this. Yeah, yeah. I, I would agree with that. I think, I think that is most likely. In fact, uh, I think we're very fortunate it hadn't happened so far. And it's going to, uh, unless the public is better prepared for it than they are now, it's going to frighten an awful lot of people. And if I were in the nuclear power business, I'd be very worried about the psychological repercussions from a dirty bomb going off because of the feeling around the world that all nuclear materials are, are unsafe. I, I think it's a real danger. So the only answer that I have is every country has to secure their radiological material. I think we need to do a better job in our country. We can't just point at other people. There's a UN resolution uh, that has passed charging every country with that responsibility. One of the things we could do with Russia, I felt, is to have U.S. and Russian uh, scientists and military people working together offer themselves to other countries that might need our expertise to secure their materials because we've worked together for the last uh, 15, 16 years. So it's very important. We stood up an organization, our foundation did. It's not the only answer to the problem. I don't want to pretend it is, but it could help. Called the World Institute of Nuclear Security, a private organization that we funded. It's now in Vienna. We have a director. We're about to get an international board. Yeah. Its job will be to invite every, every uh, in, every entity that has nuclear material, whether it's a hospital yeah. or whatever uh, the facility, agricultural yeah. use, pure, uh, food purification, to join and begin working on best practices and peer reviews all over the world. We do that on the safety side. Nuclear power industry did it after Chernobyl and Three Mile Island, but doing it on the security side is equally important. Sid, did you want to add to that? Uh, I'll just add a sentence. The greatest damage done by a, a dirty bomb is the high explosive. It's not casualties. It's psychological and economic damage. But it's very likely. All right. Uh, yes, may I add to that? Uh, there's also denial of space. You block off, you know, as Goldfinger was also a question of um, blocking off um, the U.S. Uh, uh, gold stocks in uh, Fort, uh, Fort Knox, K Kentucky. Uh, but, but my question is quite different. Uh, Senator Nunn, you talked about the missing tactical weapons. Uh, one thing about missing tactical, of tactical weapons is their shelf life. Would you comment on that? And before I finish, I might add two more things. Uh, one is, should Russia be a part of NATO? Then we can have the Russian lines of communication to Afghanistan. They're well developed. They were supporting 110,000 troops there for many years. And lastly, that nuclear disarmament, being from India, uh, has always been a uh, highlight of uh, the government of India before, before it even became independent. All right. Let's back. try Thank to you. get through that first one there. Well, on the latter question, I think it's a mis was a mistake uh, years ago to exclude, in effect, implicitly and explicitly in some cases, Russia from being a part of some type of security alliance. It may not be NATO, 
it may be a broader umbrella that NATO is a part of. So I think Russia ought to be uh, part of an Atlantic Euro security alliance, and if it's not, and I, don't, I say alliance, that may be too specific a term, if it's not, it's going to be very hard to, to deal with Russia on these major issues. I think uh, one of the things that we, we seem to have a, a difficulty with in this country is distinguishing between the vital and the vivid. Uh, things that are vivid get a lot of attention. Things that are vital sometimes get uh, almost no attention. And it's vital that we have a relationship with Russia. I must say it's vital for them, too. It's not a one-way street, and we're not going to give them veto on things. We're not going to say, we need you so you can do what you want. They, they need us also, and they need to be part of the Western world. Uh, interesting economic speech that Putin just made in Davos. The headlines were uh, the criticism of the U.S. As, as they would be. But uh, he had a lot of interesting things to say about uh, the world economic uh, situation. Very interesting speech. Uh, so, yes, I think we need to work with Russia, and we need to broaden the concept. I don't think Russia would want to be a part of NATO. I don't think there's any chance they will be an early part of NATO, but they should be part of a discussion about European security. I think that's absolutely essential. On tactical nuclear weapons and uh, so forth, uh, you know, we have what we call permissive action links where weapons that uh, are basically in our inventory and in main part, uh, have, you have to co have a code. And if you try a code two or three times and it doesn't work, they basically uh, self-destruct in the sense that they cannot be operated. It would be to the advantage of the world if every country that had nuclear weapons had PAL devices. Now, I think, I'm sure we have worked with other countries on, on that in, in some cases, our friends. I'm sure we've had some uh, discussions with uh, countries like uh, India and Pakistan. The level of trust is probably not sufficient for uh, U.S. technology to be used in all those cases, but it's certainly in our interest. Now, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, interpreted by some as blocking that kind of cooperation, uh, I don't think that's the right interpretation, but if it is, we need to take another look at it because even if a country is not part of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, if they've got nuclear weapons, we want them to have some type of device, whether it's their technology or whether it's with our system. All right, let's try to, if we could make the questions a little shorter, sure. it'd be great. Uh, Stephen So Young, we can get to more. With the Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, the Obama administration is required to do a nuclear posture review by the end of this year. Uh, and I think this is going to be a very important, obviously, look at nuclear policy, look, look at these questions. Uh, would you agree that um, there have been two of these earlier by Clinton and by Bush that were not very dramatic in the changes they recommended? Uh, would you recommend that they make more changes in this posture that are more dramatic along what you're talking about, and particularly the question of uh, should, they, should, should Obama say going in that uh, the posture review should have this as a preface, the only role for nuclear weapons as the deterrent that's it, full stop, and ba make that the very basis of the policy going forward for the posture review. You want to President, President Obama has innovated with something. He has a website that's at the answer. White House and posted on it under the heading of foreign policy is a statement that says, I can't quote it exactly, but something like, Obama and Biden will seek uh, to have a world free of nuclear weapons this is a hard job or something like that, and we'll have to take these kinds of steps that are very consistent with the sort of steps that are outlined here. And it seems to me if they, since they are in that posture, not if, they're there, they put it out publicly, that uh, that's a posture we're in, and then a lot flows from that. And uh, a lot flows from that with other countries, a lot flows from that in terms of what uh, you can expect the United States to try to do. So I think it's a good posture to go into the nonproliferation review. I think also, if we can get into this position, we'll be better off on the nonproliferation issue. The way we are now, we're sort of against other people getting nuclear weapons. And we're sitting there with lots of them. So we're trying to prevent things. We're just in a negative position. Probably a lot of people here are going to watch the Super Bowl on Sunday. And any football coach will tell you that the best defense is a good offense. So if we can get in the position that President Obama seems to be getting us into, we'll be on the offense. There's something we're for. And then lots more things are possible once you're in that position. And if you have 
action going on uh, uh, the nuclear fuel cycle, for example, that's really there and doing something, you can go to Iran as a diplomatic matter and say, okay, <laughs> so this is for peaceful <coughs> purposes, put it into this international pool with everybody else and have it supervised and manned in many respects by people from the international community so that everybody knows what's going on. So I think an awful lot of positive things flow from getting yourself in the position of saying, my goal is a world free of nuclear weapons and I'm going to work for it. Let's go here. Uh, thanks. Brian Bender with the Boston Globe. Uh, Sid mentioned the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, Nun Luger. Um, can you just give a couple of specifics um, of what you think the U.S. government, the Obama administration, needs to do immediately to achieve what it has set out to be a goal of securing that nuclear material that currently exists, or nuclear weapons material, in four years? It's taken about 15 years to secure about half of it, if my estimates are right. How do you do it in four years? Is it possible? What do you need to do immediately, two or three things? I think it can be done in four years. I think you have to um, – I think you – one thing I, I would suggest they do is take a look at what the Bush administration has done. Uh, and they've, they've done a lot. There's been a lot done. Every administration basically has the tendency to say nothing was done until we arrived. But there have been a lot of things that have been done. And on the, uh, the non luca program, the administration, they were lukewarm toward it to begin with, but they really got behind it. Uh, and then uh, they, they developed the uh, – uh, global Threat Reduction Initiative, which Sid alluded to a minute ago. Something That's working do. with Russia. We put a lot of money up from our Department of Energy to bring back highly enriched uranium that was furnished <laughs> to countries all over the world by the United States and by the Soviet Union. Uh, there's a whole list of, of countries that we're trying to bring that material back from with the cooperation of Russia that would go back to Russia and be blended down. Uh, we have a whole list of countries that we're trying to bring that material back from. but. The baseline of the GTR program and, and the non luca program is not nearly broad enough. It, on the baseline, we're making a whole lot of progress, but there's a world beyond that baseline that's not included in the original goals, and that needs to be viewed. So uh, a partnership with Russia here, but a partnership with a lot of other countries is, is absolutely essential. It's not a matter of money alone. It's money, but it's also uh, a lot of hard work and a lot of work uh, with countries that have nuclear materials that don't want to give them up. The direction that George is talking about, the vision, the steps, uh, if the United States were to, and there are things that have to be done, it has to be done carefully, there has to be hearings, there are some legitimate concerns, but they can be addressed. Yeah. But if we were to ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, it would make an enormous difference psychologically in the yeah. world. Yeah. And it would make cooperation uh, not automatic, but it would make it a lot yeah. more likely to happen in all of these areas. Let me, uh, we'll have one more question from the audience, and then I want to just go around and let everybody say, uh, uh, something they'd like to say in closing. Yes. My name is Jennifer Nepper. I'm with the Strategic Posture Commission, and I'm here on behalf of Dr. Freddie Clay, who had a question he wanted me to ask. Um, do you think the top of the mountain would require a fundamental change in the world order to prevent serious violations of, of this abolition of nuclear weapons? Would a world government be necessary? Would a United Nations with a nuclear arm, Praetorian Guard? Like, what, is, what would the end state have to look like to prevent these violations? You had certainly would want to have assurance that you have a method of detecting any cheating and you had a clear, um, sure to happen way of dealing with that cheating. And I don't think that necessarily means a world government or something. If it means that you have a, a clear <laughs> regime that people agree to, that's going to see to it that we continue to have a world free of nuclear weapons. And that's one of the kind of tasks that you have to address yourself to and figure out how you're going to do that and get people to collaborate. You can think of things immediately, but that's one of the great diplomatic tasks that, uh, just to say again, you could not accomplish that. If I were charged with negotiating that, I couldn't do it if I didn't have Sid and people like that who understand the the technicalities of this and the scientific aspects of it much better than I ever will. Well, we are getting close to the end. I want to give each of you a chance. Uh, sometimes I'm happy to say we're getting close to the end. Today I'm really sorry because it's been a <coughs> fascinating discussion. But, Sid, what's the most important thing, what's the most important thought you'd like to leave uh, this group with today? Uh, 
I, I sort of cop out at this point. Uh, I'm a physicist, and I rely on Einstein when he said, politics is much harder than science. <laughs> it's true. The, the verification needs, we, we, if we get down to small numbers, we have to verify that there's no hidden material or no hidden and disassembled warhead that we don't know about at the level of the, the, the accuracy requires greater. The level of trust we're going to have to create among countries, all countries, that they're going to allow a degree of transparency as to what's going on in their countries is beyond anything. And these are very difficult problems. I mean, and, and, and they go together. I, I can't give you a verification scheme that's going to work without an enormous trust. But people have to realize what a dangerous treadmill we're on now, starting going down, as, as Sam has said. And a world with many nuclear nations doesn't want a Cuban Missile Crisis, for example. And you look at the close calls in the Cold War when it was just one adversary. It was a bipolar world that was simple and clear. It's much more complex, much more dangerous technologies out there. And so we, we just have to understand we have to work at this problem. We have to succeed because the alternative is unacceptable. But it's a formidable diplomatic job. And when I listen to Chet Crocker and people like this talk, I realize how easy physics is. David. I mean it. Uh, what strikes me, Bob, about the problem as we've been describing it today is that we've got two issues that are operating on two very different clocks. The, the long-term issue that, that uh, Secretary Schultz and Nunn and Professor Drell have raised today of how you get down to zero and what, what stages you go to. And obviously, that is a, 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 a multi-year, if not generational effort. And then with the states that we are most concerned about now, um, with Iran, with North Korea, different kind of problem with Pakistan and India, and with states that we're fearful could get a weapon if Iran, for example, made progress. We're working on a much shorter clock, where President Obama is going to have to make decisions probably within a year or two on Iran if he's going to stop them from getting that capability. We may be too late already on North Korea after their, their nuclear test. And so to add to the political complexity that Sid laid out here is you've got to somehow convince the American people how you have one set of policies for the short-term clock and another for the longer term. And I think you've made the argument here today, which may well be right, that they're reinforcing. If we're coming down, you can convince other countries to as well. But we may get into a situation where we're in at least a diplomatic confrontation and perhaps something worse with some of these countries that are seeking a new capability. And I'm not sure that the new administration yet has sort of gotten their minds around how you handle both that short-term and longer-term planning. Secretary Schultz. I think we have to work at this with a sense of urgency. And no doubt it will take a long time, but I don't think we should keep saying that. I think we should say this is an important problem, and we see things that we have to do, so let's get going and do them. And if we do that, I think maybe we'd be surprised at how much could get accomplished. And if people around the world saw that somehow the leaders of the world are able to take on a difficult subject and really begin to do something constructive about it that's going to make everybody safer, they may say, gee, the world looks pretty good after all. And maybe we can do some other things and have to get some encouragement out of that. I might just do one little plug here. As we talked, our little group, about what can we do? We're not government, we're just guys out there trying to be helpful. We thought, well, one thing we can do is look at these steps and try to get the most professional, scientifically trained people we can find to address themselves to each of these steps. And then convene very knowledgeable people, distribute these papers ahead of time, and discuss them intensely. And then have them revise their papers in the light of the discussion. And the book, that, the fat book that you have is the result of that, and the thinner one by Chet Crocker is the same process with respect to the uh, diplomatic side. 
So we've tried to give the president and his advisors, if they decide they really want to get going, something to look at to get started with. These are the things, steps you need to take. These are considerations about them by people who are really knowledgeable, and here are some people who are willing to work with you to help do this and move this ball along. So uh, if anybody here has a chance to get in to see the president, why well, don't you give him a copy of that book? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Senator Don, you want to take uh, her on home here? Yeah, well, the fi the fi my final thought would be that uh, I think the main thing that has happened out of these Wall Street Journal articles is that with, the, uh, with, with Schultz and with Kissinger and Bill Perry and myself, people who've gone through the Cold War, Sid Drell, Max Kampelman, many other people, in fact, 60%, uh, something like 65% of all the living National Security Advisors, Secretaries of State and Secretaries of Defenses have signed up for this uh, initiative. It's not just us, it's a, a lot of very strong people, some of whom Democrats and Republicans. Democrats about and equal Republicans. Numbers, so we've partisan. got a, a, a big consensus. We've had four of the top uh, leading former statesmen in Germany just uh, penned a, an op-ed piece <coughs> on this subject, endorsing this approach, and so same thing in England. Uh, and so there, there is some momentum, but the main thing that's been done so far, I think, and the mo thing that will pay the most <coughs> dividend is we, I think, have made the political ground and intellectual ground safe for young people who will be dealing with this problem uh, to, to really tackle it. And, and that's happening all over, not just in this country, but around the globe. A lot of bright young people are saying, hey, this is something that's going to affect our generation. Uh, these old guys have talked about it, now we're going to uh, really try to do something about it. Uh, I have a, a sense of urgency about it, as George said, and one way that I, I approach this, this whole thing intellectually and have for a long time is asking myself the question, if there was a nuclear explosion and one of the great cities in America went up in smoke or another city around the world went up in smoke and hundreds of thousands of people were killed and the world was traumatized, the economic system was basically shut down because of lack of confidence, uh, what are the things we wish we would wish we had done uh, to prevent it? Uh, and then once you make that list and you say, why aren't we doing them now? Uh, and let's get started. And, and that's what we're trying to do. But it, it'll, it'll, take, it'll take some time. But we've unleashed, I think, a, a lot of creativity out there with people a lot smarter uh, than I am that are going to be tackling this, this business. We have a base uh, camp study going on. We have a verification study going on. We've got a lot of bright people working on it. So. Uh, by and large, I, I think that uh, that uh, we're going to have a lot of a lot of progress on this this point. I'm, I'm reasonably optimistic in a very troubled world. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, on behalf of CSIS and TCU.